Good morning, everybody. How are you doing today? Hey, come on, folks. Have We're you great. Amen. <laughs> Harper, how are you today? We've got a big problem. I just want you to know we've got a big problem here this morning. Number one, Emma's birthday is tomorrow. Ooh. And number two, Harper's birthday is Tuesday. <laughs> so we got a big problem. <laughs> okay. Happy birthday, John. Oh, yeah, John, Brother John's. Brother John, where are you at? Where are you at? Are you hiding from me? Yes. He's having a birthday today. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you how old you are, bro. He's 45. He's what? 29. Boy, everybody just, y'all Y'all are so nice <laughs> passing out all this personal information. Okay. WMU meeting this evening at 5.30, Fellowship Hall. And uh, so, ladies, be aware of that. Also, uh, need to uh, uh, let you know that uh, uh, Angie Goldsmith did have uh, uh, kidney stone removed yesterday uh, it was really a, a big one and uh, she's in the hospital at BSA and so I want to be in prayer for Angie she did well through it everything seems to be seems to be moving in a good uh, direction uh, Keith Mitchell uh, he is uh, Betty Whitehead's son and he's uh, he had a stroke, so we want to be in prayer for Keith uh, uh, Mitchell. Also, Wanda Smiley, her husband Brad, they took him out here this morning, tested him, and uh, they felt like that he had a stroke as well, so they had uh, transferred him to BSA uh, in Amarillo. So be in prayer for Brad, okay? Uh, we have several guests with us this morning. It's good to have, good to have you all here with us, and uh, there is an appendage on the worship guide. If you want to fill that out, drop it, put it in the offering plate. Uh, we we used to say drop it in the offering plate when it goes by, but we don't pass those anymore, uh, or at least not right now. We may do that again one of these days, just to surprise everybody. <coughs> Okay, I'm going to ask a real personal question. How many of y'all would rather be here than in the hospital? Yeah. See, it's almost 100%. <laughs> okay, well, it's, I'm glad to have y'all here this morning. We're going to stand, have a word of prayer, and then do our pledges this morning. And, and our uh, birthday girl for tomorrow is going to come and lead us in our pledges. Father, this morning we come before you and thank you for this time that you've given us. We pray, Father, that today, today, Father, we would make the right choice, that we would do the right thing, that we would move in the right direction. But Lord, we know that we can't do that unless we surrender to you and allow you to work in and through us. So, Father, today, let it be your will your way. Lord, we love you and praise you and thank you for everything that you've done. And we just ask that you continue to bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we do our pledges, I want to just say Brother Barg's had three treatments. He's doing real well and uh, and he's he's staying out of trouble. <laughs> Did I overstep that? Maybe. Okay. No? Okay. Okay, Emma. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I shall never forget that I am an American citizen, responsible for my actions. 
glad they're here. And uh, then we'll, uh, we'll, Brother Alan, will take us on. On. Amen. Amen.
place the back in the back. We'd like to thank everyone through this pandemic time that have been so thankful. So, as we sing this song, just make your way back there. Dude. Let me pray and then we'll do this. Father, we come to you now. Father, we come at this time of worship. And we can come, Father, and we can give back to you part of that you've given us. Lord, I pray that you would bless this time. Father, bless those that can share and Father, those that can. And I just uh, lift this to you in Christ's name.
Romans 14. You know there's a right way and a wrong way to do everything, right? Um, <laughs> well, I usually do it wrong. It seems like I'm, I get it wrong uh, so often. In an episode of an old show called Law and Order, I don't know if you all have ever heard that. No? Oh, yeah. There was a political zealot uh, who had killed several people that uh, didn't agree with his views. He was arrested. In, in response to one of the questions that a detective asked him, he said, I'm just a band-aid on a bullet hole. And the detective asked him, who's bleeding to death? And he said, America. Now, I start off with that this morning because in reality, America is bleeding. Not from a bullet hole, but from internal injuries. There's a, a moral and spiritual wound causing this issue of blood. Our political leaders, some military leaders, some spiritual leaders, uh, prof professionals in, in every realm all have moral problems. But it doesn't stop there, does it? It goes down the quote-unquote ladder, if you will. Each of us have moral problems that we have to deal with. Things that have to come to the uh, forefront in our lives and we have to, we have to deal with. One of the reasons that I believe this is happening is because of the changing family. The traditional family is a thing of the past. 40% 40, 40 maybe a little bit more of our children grow up in homes without, without their the biological family there. Even what is actually family is now being challenged uh, so they become politically correct. The second reason is the influence of the media. Television is not only, has, has not only dropped off, in many respects it's taken us to the very pit of hell. And I, I'm not talking just about the national news. I'm talking about the shows as well. In one two-panel, I'm, I'm a cartoon person, if you don't know me very well, but I'm a cartoon person. And in one two-panel cartoon, uh, a woman asked her husband to take out the garbage in the first panel. In the second panel, he carried the TV out. Uh, the truth of the matter is, is that TV dinners now have more taste than TV. The third reason is moral relativism. Did you know that 60% of Americans don't believe in absolute truth? Don't believe in absolute truth. In other words, Right or wrong is whatever they desire to be. Have you all ever heard of Willie Nelson before? Willie Nelson uh, uh, bought his own golf course. And uh, when he was asked what par was, he replied, whatever I want it to be. And it's clear that when morals die, 
laws die. When laws die, the nation dies. Carl Henry, a noted evangelical uh, theologian, said, any nation that ignores moral absolutes is in danger of marching off the map. Now these moral absolutes appear because God said they are right. Right is right because God said so. Wrong is wrong because God said so. America is facing uh, one of two outcomes in, in the, in the not-too-distant future. Either moral anarchy or spiritual revival. And we, 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 I've, heard of, I've heard of places and churches that have gone through tremendous revivals in the last few months. Not because, not because they're preaching something brand new, but because they're continuing to share the good news of Jesus Christ and people are responding to that. <clears throat> Knowing right from wrong can be uh, seems to be increasingly difficult in, in our world today. And yet God is true to His Word and gives us the compass by which to live. Now in Romans chapter 14, there are three principles of, of Christian conduct. And, and the first is accountability. And uh, because ultimately we are responsible to God. You're not responsible to me. You're responsible to God. Now, the second is love. We need, we, need to, we need to love people. We need to love people right where they're at. And, and, and it's so easy to love everybody, isn't it? Seriously, folks? No. No, it's not. It's not easy to love everybody. But we need to be concerned about the... the our, how our love impacts the lives of others. And we, the third is conscience. Don't, we don't do anything unless you're absolutely, absolutely sure it's acceptable. Now, the truth of the matter is, is that, that it's difficult to make these decisions. It's difficult to, to, to be accountable. It's difficult to love. It's difficult to let our conscience move us and direct us in the way that we need to go. But if we do some things that we're going to look at this morning, I think that if we do those things, it's going to help us and move us in the direction that we need to go. First of all, we need to take the test. First, the test of Scripture. Hmm. Who would have thought by looking into Scripture that Scripture would show us the way? John chapter 14, I mean Romans chapter 14, verse, verse 10, but he, but he says, but you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we shall, not all, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now, uh, the, we, need to, we need to remember that, that we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every one of us. God's not left uh, us to simply roll around in the darkness, we, we need to understand that we're going to give an account of God ourselves. We're going to have to give, we're going to stand before Him and we're going to have to, to, to say, this is it. And, uh, you know, God, we, we, we can't just simply, just like I say, grope around in the darkness. Well, He gives us the answers in Scripture. Look with me, if you will, in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. My Bible is on page 1243. I don't know where it's at over here. 
the 12, 1243. And, and this is, that you need to understand that we need to understand this, that this Bible is not just something there to uh, once in a while direct us. But it says in verses 16 and 17 in 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God, and I'm going to, I know what Paul was talking about here when he was talking to Timothy, but I'm going to put in here that the man or woman of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Amen. Folks, you and I need to, we need to understand that, that the, we, we, we have to know what the Bible has to say to us. It was this way for Jesus as he began his earthly ministry. Satan came to him in, in, in Luke chap, chapter 4, in the beginning verses of, of Luke chapter 4, that Satan came to him with three temptations. First of all, he said, turn these stones into bread. And, and, and Jesus had been out there for 40 days. I mean, you know, he was hungry. Turn these stones into bread. Uh, but what, what Satan was wanting to do was that have this ministry that was based on material things. And then he said the second temptation was cast himself from the pinnacle of the temple. And... and, and I mean, I like, I like really amazing things. Why, I mean, wonderful things, exciting things. But we cannot, we cannot base ministry on the spectacular things. We have to understand that on a day-to-day -day basis, we, our ministry has to go forward and move forward and accomplish the things that God wants us to do. And for Jesus to cast himself from the temple, uh, from the pinnacle of the temple, that that what was that going to do? One thing, you know. Uh, so he said no. Then the third thing was is fall down and worship Satan. And this is this is just uh, having a ministry that's based on compromise. We cannot compromise what we believe and what we understand the teachings of God to be. The, the Word of God. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's just like Paul. That it's just like Paul told Timothy uh, there. He says that the, so that we might be the man of God, the woman of God, may be adequate and equipped for every good work. You know, there's there's things that are coming up in our lives that we're going to have to be ready for, be ready to move in and and go for these. Jesus said after each one of these, Jesus said, "It is written." Then he took the word of God. Now I'm going to ask you, where was it written? Was it written in Reader's Digest? Not hardly. Was it written in, in Newsweek? It was written in the word Amen. of God. And I think that uh, Jesus, Jesus learned the word early in his life. And had he not known the scripture, he would have had not known how to respond to, to, to Satan at this time. The psalmist said in Psalm, Psalm 119.11, Thy word I treasured in I, my heart that I may not sin against thee. And that's what Jesus did. Now, I, I mean, Jesus was Jesus, right? So he was God, right? But don't forget, Jesus was Jesus. Joseph and Mary was a little boy. And he was human. Jesus, Jesus, uh, Jesus fought these battles. We know, we know, we I shared with you from Luke chapter 4. Jesus was confronted with Satan and the temptations. Do you think these were the only three times that Jesus was confronted with temptations from Jesus? From Satan? Absolutely not. You know, I mean, it was, it was, it was, who knows what all took place. Daily. Da yeah, daily. Thank you, Brother Jim. I mean, you know, it's just, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that you and I have to understand in our lives. God, God is, is going to be there. 
But, but we know that Satan is going to be there. So parents, parents need to teach the scripture. Amen. Children need to learn the scripture. Yeah. I mean, if, if we're going to walk through this life, we all need the scripture. Uh, we need, if we're going to be able to, to win the battles in this life, we're going to have to know the word of God. And we're going to have to be able to apply it in our lives on a moment by moment by moment basis. Are we going to be perfect? No. no. But we can be spirit led. Yeah. And we can accomplish what God would have us to accomplish. A.W. Tozer once said, put this down as an unfailing rule. Never seek the leading of the Lord concerning an act that is forbidden in the word of God. To do so is to convict yourself of insincerity. I think, Tozer, what are, you, what are you thinking of, dude? He's thinking of life. He's thinking of life. You know, never seek the leading of the Lord concerning an act that is forbidden in the Word of God. Now, I'm going to get to that here in just a moment. Because we move. We move from this test of the scripture to the test of influence. The Bible. If the Bible is going to influence us, it's going to have to influence us each step of the way. It's not like a, it's not like a, a rule book that, that we have in an athletic event. You know, it's uh, uh, that covers every, every little detail. The Bible says nothing specifically about abortion. It says nothing about the use of drugs except alcohol. And, and we know that, that I mean, you can, you can look in here, and I, I've looked through the scripture. Uh, I've even looked in the Hebrew and in the Greek. And I can't find one thing about pornography. And there are scores of other things that we face today that Scripture does not specifically point out. But if an issue is not dealt with in Scripture, we can. How do we? How do we know what's what's right and what's wrong? We've got to re re rely upon the true principle of God's Word. Amen. One guiding principle is love. We're not only responsible to God, but we're responsible to our brothers and sisters. Amen. We've got to ask ourselves that, uh, about a questionable thing. How is it going to affect God, and how will it affect others? How is it going to, how will what we do affect a, a new Christian? We are to walk charitably before one another. And that's what, if you look at verse 13, walk according to love. And then, and then you look at verses 20 and 21. He said, we're not, you know, don't, don't tear down the work of, of God for the sake of food. All things are clean, but are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It's not good to eat any meat or to drink wine, or to do anything by which your by which your brother stumbles. To live by the principle of love means that we care more about others than we care about ourselves. It means our life is not governed by selfish desires. We don't only think of our own pleasures and wishes, but our but how is it going to influence and impact others? There's a hymn, and I didn't put it all down, but I put down the very first part of, of, of it, and, and, it's, and the title of it is Others. And it says, Others, Lord, yes, others. Let that my motto be. Help me to live for others that I may live like thee. Hmm. 
I don't do so well all the time. How about you? We've got to voluntarily limit what we what we do in our lives if, if it's going to hinder someone else. By doing this, or we ask ourselves, by doing this or going to this place, will I influence others to follow my example? Uh, would it be okay if everyone did what I'm doing? Uh, would, would I be disappointed in them or lose faith in them if they did the same thing that I was doing? We've got to be careful that our influence is, it is used in a way that's based on the principle of love. Do y'all remember that one verse? It says, love your neighbor as yourself. How's that going for us? Not very well. <laughs> Sometimes it, it's a real push. I'm telling you. Vicki and I slipped away this past week. Went to, went to Missouri. You know what one of the greatest things about where we stayed? I mean, we stayed in this pretty nice little hotel. Josh would arrange it. Uh, but, uh, but we stayed in this. What was really so nice about it was is that I didn't hear anybody on this side of us or this side of us or above us. It was just quiet. And there were people in those rooms. And I didn't hear anything. But when I would get up to do something or I turned the TV on when we walked back into the room to watch the news or whatever and I turned the TV on, then he'd say, don't turn it up too loud. We don't want to bother anybody. Well, so what they weren't doing to us, we didn't want to do to them, right? Now, I'm not going to tell you the pain and struggle that I had driving in Branson. I, I, all, I, all I've got to say is, is that main streets in Branson are worse than Holbrook. Enough <laughs> said. But what, what kind of influence if what, what do we what kind of influence do we have if we're not doing things the way God would have us to do? In accordance with His will and His word. Think about it. God's word shows us the right way to live and influence others. We can choose the wrong way, but it's our choice. But then I'm going to I'm going to go towards the end of chapter 14 here. And uh, and we're going to have a test, a test. A test of conscience. We need to realize that we're not only responsible to God and to others, but to ourselves. Ourselves. Paul tells us in verse 23. Look at verse 23. That he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he is eating his is eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. The word faith here means conviction or persuasion. And so if you're not fully persuaded, absolutely convinced that the thing is right, then don't do it. Our conscience can be defined as a, a divinely implanted uh, faculty of us uh, to guide us in matters that are right and wrong. Every person, unless they're deranged, has a conscience. While the conscience is God-given, the content depends somewhat on what we've been taught, right? Every person recognizes that there are some universal truths. It's wrong to kill, to steal, to lie. Even people 
who say they have no moral absolutes will often say, well, that's not fair. This means they believe that there are certain uni universal absolutes that everyone should adhere to in life. If our conscience has been regenerated by the power of God and, and we have learned what God's Word has to say to us, it becomes a, a, a moral uh, a compass in our, our lives. If it, it, it serves as a, if you will, a, a traffic light. If it's green, we have to go from God. If it's uh, yellow, uh, we're not sure, so let's wait. But if it's red, God says, don't go ahead. Don't go ahead. If, we're, if we choose to ignore the lights, we may end up in a wreck. Have you ever been sitting at a stoplight and somebody ignored the lights? A good rule to go by, if in doubt, don't. If we ignore our conscience, we, we, we are, I believe, as born-again believers, we are ignoring the voice of God in our lives. And, you know, uh, is, is this something that that uh, I, I want to, you know, put under the darkness? Is this something I want to hide with, uh, you know, would I be ashamed if others found out about it? Uh, man, what would mom say about this? I know what dad would do, but have you ever, have you ever thought, have you ever thought about somebody, well maybe if you're a Sunday school teacher, and you were thinking about saying something and you thought, man, if I say that my Sunday school teacher would just drive me nuts. If I'd be ashamed for others to know about it, it's a good sign. It's not something I need to do. Colin Powell said, a sense of shame is not really a bad moral compass. Norman Schwarzkopf said, the truth of the matter is is that you always know the right thing to do. The hard part is doing it. That's where Christ comes in. He gives us the power to do the right we know to do. With, without His internal uh, strength and guidance, we we're, we're lost uh, and separated and we struggle. As we study Scripture, we become aware of what God desires us to do. Our, our conscience is guided by our understanding of God's Word. James chapter 4 verse 17 says, Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. You might not know it's the right thing to do because of, you might know it's the right thing to do because of Scripture. You might know it's the right thing to do because of the positive influence it, it will have. And you, you might know it's the right thing to do because your conscience says it is. Some of you may know it's, some of you know it's the right thing for you to, to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Scripture says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of that sin is death. But the gift that God gives is eternal life. Jesus, Jesus didn't just die for a certain group of people. He died for all of us. Jesus, Jesus died. I'm going to pick on Brother Allen for a bit because he's right here. He's so easy. Brother Allen has, he has not always stood up here and led music. 
He's not always been a deacon. He's not always been a member of this church. He's not always been a Christian. But when the right time came, Jan. <laughs> I was getting to it. <laughs> and for Lee. When the right time came, he walked the aisle. And he gave his heart to Jesus. Now, I'm, I'm just saying that it's the right thing to turn from unconfessed sin to confession of sin and Christ. That's the right thing. Some of you know it's the right thing to surrender your life in obedience to God. Scripture tells us He has in He has told you away what is good. What does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, y'all look at preachers and you say, "Oh, those preachers—they're such—I mean, they're so wonderful. They just follow God." Uh, you know, I know a whole lot of people that have never stood up in a pulpit and preached a sermon that are wonderful people of God and have followed closely after God. I mean, right now, Joshua's here today. Joshua Price. My Joshua's here too, but Joshua Price is here. And, and Joshua's, he's home right now from school because school's out. And, and, but he is getting ready to go and he'll be gone for the Go Now mission trip this summer. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I think it's awesome. Number one, I think it's awesome that the people from Go Now have to know him and they're still letting him go. <laughs> no. no I mean, but Joshua is... God's using Joshua and going to expand him. But he had to say yes to that calling in his life and surrender to that and to accept that God was moving him into that direction. He has told us, oh man, what is good? What does he, the Lord, require of you? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly. God. Some of you know it's the right thing to be a part of this church family. Scripture tells us don't and, and don't forsake the assembling together as the habit of some is, but encouraging one another and all the wars you see that day drawing near. Now I've been using this encouraging, encouraging one another. God's been laying this on. But it, it's really good to encourage people, isn't it? I mean, when they're down and they're struggling, it's, it's really, really good for, for them to know that, you, that you're there. And, and, and now, is, uh, now is the time when things need to be moved in, in the direction that they need to move in. Every person here this morning has a decision to make. You'll either make the right one or the wrong one. Okay? Now here's the sermon in the nutshell. The right thing to do is what Jesus called you to do. The wrong thing to do is to walk out of here and say, I'm good. I'm good. So I'm asking you this morning. Do you know Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior? If you do, thank you. If you don't, receive him. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you know him, praise him. If you don't, hook up with him today. Call on his name. Ask him to come into your heart, forgive you of your sins, and to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. You, you already know him. 
you still have a couple of questions that you have to ask. Am I going to follow him? Or is he going to have to hunt me down? Y'all want to hunt me for it. <laughs> yeah, no. That's right. Folks, I want you to understand something. We can sit here in this place and we can pat ourselves on the back. I'm such a good person. I went to church. I did this. I put some money in the offering plate. I said a prayer last week. And that's, I'm not, those are good things. Don't get me wrong. But those things, like one of the preachers, his name happened to be Will Graham, the grandson of Billy Graham. He said those things aren't going to save you. Jesus is the one that's going to give you life and give you life eternal. So this morning, the right thing for you to do is to walk out of here saying, I know Jesus is my Savior. The wrong thing for you to do is say, oh gee, I think I covered that years ago. You need to know for sure that Jesus is Lord of your life. If he's not, today's the day get it taken care of. Father, this morning we come to you and we ask, Father, that you would just be with us during this time. Lord, I know that, I know, Father, that we often think we've got it right. But Lord, help us to know this morning that we know it's right and we're where we need to be. I pray, Father, that the Holy Spirit will move in hearts and minds and, and bring them to where they need to be. We love you, Lord, and thank you what you're going to do. In Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing the hymn of invitation. Now, we're going to do it without the piano. Now, I'm telling you, this is this is going strictly Church of Christ. <laughs> but that's that's alright. Because Brother Allen's leaders. No, wait a minute. God's leaders. And without him, we can do that. Let's sing this. Without him I could do nothing. Without him I surely fail. Without him I would be drifting like a ship.
but that's just that's part of who he's always been. And I'm just so thankful God's used me. Joshua, would you close us out? God, thank you for this time of fellowship that we've had this 